You know, many of you guys may be familiar, and you may not, but if you aren't, I'll share with you. In Joshua chapter 6, we read one of the more famous accounts in the Bible, and this is the Battle of Jericho. And many believers are aware of Jericho. It's, it's, the, it's the place where, you know, the, the walls come tumbling down. You heard that little story, and the walls came tumbling down at Jericho. Um, and even little kids sing about it, which is kind of weird because it's this battle death scene, but kids sing about it. But Christians do that sometimes, you know, hey, we're weird. And, uh, and so... Did you see this, this um, scenario where the walls come down in Jericho in this big city? But what, what people don't often realize is that what makes it famous, it's, it's not because the Israelite nation had this real great military might, right? It's not because, you know, they were strategically so minded and so they, they planned this great strategy. Well, well, on the east side of the wall, we'll do a, a battering ram. And then on the, the other west side of the wall and north and south, we're going to do a siege and we're going to prevent them from, you know, getting any food. And they didn't come up with some strategy like that any military genius might come up with. Rather, God told them, and as you may know, he told them to march around the city seven times for seven days. That's it. That was it. That's the great military strategy that's so counterintuitive to anything that we could think of. I mean, it's ludicrous. Nonetheless, they did that, and they marched around, and, and we read in the Bible in Joshua chapter 6 that the walls came down miraculously. And God intentionally had them do this, and it was meant to very clearly demonstrate not only to the nation of Israel to give them encouragement and teach them, but to the entire world that was watching the nation of Israel, that they would know that God's power miraculously moved through them. And so if you were a neighboring country, you would say, oh my gosh, they serve the living God. If you were the nation of Israel, you'd say, oh my gosh, we serve the living God. You know, I mean, they would sit there and say, wow, God is mighty. Did you just see that miracle he did? And God moved through them so miraculously and so a lot of us are familiar with that passage of Scripture. What's interesting is that we're not actually familiar with what happened right after that. Well, 7 follows 6. And so as you read in Joshua 7, you realize that the Israelites then moved on to the city of Ai. And they sent out some spies to go check out Ai. And Ai was actually um, a smaller city. And so they came back and said, oh, yeah. This is much smaller than the city of Jericho. This is going to be no big deal. In fact, let's not even worry about bothering the whole army. We'll just send out a 3,000. And what they didn't know is that there had happened to be a problem by a fellow named Achan. Achan, Achan. And Achan, when he was in the, the, the uh, siege of Jericho, had stolen some gold. And he stole this gold and he hid it in his tent. The problem with that is that God specifically told all the people, you're not to keep any of the gold or any of the plunder from the, the, the uh, victory in Jericho. All that's to be devoted to me. You're not to keep any of it. And so what we see happen is the Israelites go out. They send 3,000 people to conquer Achan, not Achan, to conquer the city of Ai. And they're defeated. And you see, you have to put yourself in the shoes of Joshua and the nation of Israel. This makes no sense. Here they have this huge enemy, this huge army, the city of Jericho, and they find complete victory by the power of God. And then they go to this little, small, tiny nation. I mean, they were a couple hundred thousand warriors of the nation of Israel. And they have this tiny one, and they send 3,000, they get defeated. And so here's Joshua, he's dumbfounded, but more than dumbfounded, he's, he's absolutely just baffled and, and upset and angry. And he says, God, God, how could you do this? How could you give us such great miraculous victory in Jericho, but then just now a couple of days later, let us be completely defeated by this smaller, minuscule enemy? And listen to what God says to Joshua in, in, in Joshua 7, 10. The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. He was on his ground crying out to God. What are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant, which I command them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen, and they have lied, and they have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. 
They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you that is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourself in preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. They are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies unless you remove them. Now, why do I start off with this? Because we've been going through a series called Breakthrough. The series of Breakthrough has meant to encourage us and challenge us and lead us into a new breakthrough of God's power within our lives. Recognizing that, as it says in Ephesians 3.20, that God wants to do immeasurably more in our lives than we can ask for or imagine. We recognize the simple fact that God has a plan for us, a plan to move in us more mightily, that there isn't this, should not be rather, this discrepancy to the miraculous lives that God displayed in the book of Acts and in the birth of the church in our lives in the 21st century that we serve the same God, that he's the same today, yesterday, and forever, and that he wants to move in our life just as miraculously and just as powerfully, yet we tend to settle for so much less, and we tend to seek to serve God, to walk with God on our own strength, and we become at best ineffective, at worst completely ineffective, from reaching the goals that God has for us, from living the life of power. And the reason why I share this passage in Joshua 7 is because one of the barriers that keeps God from breaking through in power is that same barrier that kept God breaking through in power in the nation of Israel when they were facing their enemy Ai. And that was sin. Sin not only kills us, because sin leads to death, but sin also prevents the power of God moving within our lives. If we want to experience a breakthrough of God's power, you guys, we need to deal with the issue of sin in our lives. We cannot ignore, hide, or pretend that it does not exist, and then expect, count on, the power of God to move within our lives. Here's the problem. I'm a sinner. I would argue that I'm the chief sinner. Apostle Paul claimed that he was. I would like to fight him for that title, unfortunately. But we all sin. In Romans 3.23, we read that that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In fact, he gets even more radical. If you look at the book of John, 1 John, it says in 1 John 1, 8, that it says that you, everyone sins. And if you say you do not sin, you're actually a liar. Dude, the Bible just called you a liar if you say you're not sinning. I mean, that's radical. He says you're a liar if you hadn't sinned. But see, it's this battle. I want the power of God in my life, but I struggle with sin, and sin is keeping me from having the power of God in my life. And just as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, he says, look it, there's this battle going on. I do what I do not want to do, and that which I don't want to do, it's that what I keep on doing. I mean, let me read it to you so there's no mistake. In Romans 7, we read, beginning in verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, I do not understand what I do. This is Apostle Paul. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, that I do. And if it, I do it, what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does, does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do, do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do not want to do, if I do not, so many do's, it's hard these do-do's. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is a sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, But here's a look at this key piece here in verse 23. I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. You ever feel that way? You have this battle within you, this war within you. What a wretched man am I. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? 
And then here's our, our hope verse, our victory verse. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself in mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Amen. That battle. We want to have a breakthrough of God. So I want to talk to you guys how we can find victory of that battle within. Maybe you're not struggling with a sin issue in your life today. If that's the case, praise God. Get ready, because in about five minutes you may. You see, the fact is, is that we all struggle with sin. But God wants us to find victory in that. He doesn't want us to live defeated lives. He doesn't want us to live lives where we face our own enemies, metaphorical AIs, our own battles, and lose without the power of God. He wants us to seek to, to go do battle, but with victory and through his power. The battle belongs to the Lord if we will allow him to have those battles in our lives. But we need to deal with the issue of sin. And so today I want to talk just about a couple different ways that we can learn and we can practically apply the scripture, the word of God, to where we find victory over the battle within that we all face. And to do this, I want to look at a story in the Old Testament about a guy named Joseph. You are probably familiar, but Joseph was one of the Israelites you know, that ended up in slavery. He was sold by his brothers into slavery. And we read of Joseph, who was a man seeking after God, in Genesis 39, who faced a temptation to sin, but he overcame that battle within by applying a few practical strategies. And I want you to look at a couple of these and see how relevant they are to our own lives. Read with me if you brought your Bibles or follow along on the screen into Genesis 39, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Now Potiphar put him in charge of his household. His, he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From, time, from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. So God blessed, the blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. I was named after this guy, by the way. It's true. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. And look at this, what he says here. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though he, she spoke to him day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. In fact, one day he went into the house to attend his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. What an example you know, there's so many things in there that's chock full of just powerful things that we can learn how Joseph overcame that battle within. And one of the key things that he first did is that he chose to recognize sin as sin. I imagine if I was in myself in Joseph's shoes, I would be sitting there angry with God that first I was a slave. I'm like, man, I was the son of a rich man and now I'm a slave? Now look at me? I deserve to sin and get some good pleasure. I deserve this. You know, that person does me wrong. And we do that. When we feel like we've been wronged, we then can justify our sin. So it's like, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, you know what? They did this to me. I can go ahead and wrong this person back. I have a right to, don't I? And we justify it. But Joseph doesn't do that. He doesn't sit there and say, oh, you know what? I just don't want to risk my position or anything like that. You know what? If we had it, he doesn't dismiss it. He doesn't excuse it. He doesn't do anything to diminish it as it. He says, and we read in verse 9, he says that how could I do such a thing as sin against God? 
One of the biggest challenges that we have is so we can not diminish sin in our lives is simply be honest and recognize sin as sin. The challenge is, is that we're faced with so much a different barometer in society is that we allow the barometer of society of what's right and wrong dictate our barometer when God says you need to allow my word to be the dictation of what is wrong, right and wrong and what is sin and what is not sin. Do you know that the word sin is actually, it comes from a, um, an archery term? Think of a bullseye when you're shooting an arrow. The bullseye is the goal you want to hit, right? Anything off the bullseye is sin. The challenge is that the world has a different bullseye than God. And we are constantly sitting there evaluating which bullseye we want to hit based on our own feelings. And God is saying, if you're going to deal with the issue of sin, you need to begin by recognizing, according to God's word, this is sin. Not justifying it, not excusing it, and God understands that sin will kill us. Sometimes we want to play around with sin and think it's not a big deal. And God's saying, look, it, if it wasn't a big deal then why do you think I would send my only begotten son to pay for it with a brutal death? You think it's really no big deal? You think I'm going to sweep it under the carpet because it's not a big deal? No, I think it's such a big deal that I'm going to send my own son to die on the cross for it. That's how big of a deal it is. Why? Because it kills you. It separates you from me and the power that could be flowing in you. It it leads to death. It may feel good like you're scratching a mosquito bite. It feels good, but you scratch that mosquito bite. It's just an ongoing thing. You want to keep scratching it, and it leads to infection. Sin is that same way. It feels good while you're doing it and you're scratching it, but it ends up leading to infection. It ends up growing and making the situation worse. And so we have to sit there and say, no, this is bad because God declared it so. This is sin. And Joseph does that. But he doesn't just stop there, does it? Look again. He says in verse 11, excuse me, 10. He says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And then he spoke to Joseph day after day. She spoke to Joseph day after day. Yet he refused to go to bed with her and even be with her. Now, why would he not even want to be with her? Because he understood that he didn't want to give into the temptation. That sin itself is a temptation, and he had good boundaries. He fled. He guarded his heart, and he fled from the sin. If we are to find victory from the battle within, we need to begin by understanding that what is sin is sin, and not trying to excuse, diminish, justify, or ignore the sin in our life. We need to start by recognizing it. But then we need to guard our hearts against it. You see, sometimes we want to play with sin. I love what it says in Genesis 4-7. It gives us this really radical metaphor. In Genesis 4-7, we read that sin is crouching at our door, seeking to master us. That's like a little gremlin or something like that, just waiting to jump up and get you. You know, I mean, sin's that way. It desires to master you. And it's crouching outside your door. The problem is that we like to leave the door open just a little bit, don't we? How close to the edge can I get? How close to the edge of that sin can I get? Can I watch that one show that's not quite pornography, but it's kind of pornography? It's not too bad. It's on daytime, right? You know, I mean, can I, can I get, how close can I get? Oh, you know what, that person is really flattering to me. I wonder if Joseph could, said to himself, if he could have said to himself, or what would have happened if he had said, you know what, I'm not going to sleep with her, but she sure is a good ego boost, you know, and she really flatters me and she thinks I'm pretty hot. Yeah, that makes me feel good. I bet I'll just go around with her and let her stroke my ego. And then, but I won't do anything. You see, you guys, that's leaving the door to sin open. We think we can defeat it, but we really can't. I love what Proverbs, referring to sin and sexual sin specifically, says in verse 27 of chapter 6 of Proverbs. It says, can a man scoop fire into the lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? It means if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. We are not so strong where we think, oh, you know, and and let's be honest, sexual sin is rampant within the church. You have married people having affairs. You have single people sleeping around in idolatry or fornication. You have um, all sorts of people hooked on pornography nowadays. I mean, it's rampant. 
And yet we too to play with it. It's not that you wake up one day and say, oh yeah, I'm going to have an affair today. That doesn't happen, generally speaking. I mean, it's just that you open the door to sin and you allow it. You don't guard your heart. I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, I'm married, so it's okay for me to go out on a date with another girl. But don't worry, I'm not going to do anything. And you just don't do that. You've got to guard your heart. You've got to have good guardrails. And even still, you have to take it a step further. Because sometimes you're going to be around a situation, and you can get enticed, and you'll be put in a situation where you have to decide, am I even going to flee from it? Because it says that there was one day that Joseph was there. All the other attendants and servants were gone. And she came up and grabbed a hold of Joseph. And we read there that Joseph literally fled, leaving his coat there behind, and took off so that he would not engage in sin. I think how powerful is that? Are you willing to lose your metaphorical coat in order to maintain the hold of the power of God in your life? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about <clears throat> when we allow sin to remain active in our lives, we engage or we lose the power of God in our lives. And the simple truth of the fact is, is that Joseph modeled for us a willingness to flee, to abandon all. I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. One of my favorite verses challenges me, encourages me. It says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, it says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles you. And run the race that's been marked out for you. Run that race, but throw off everything that hinders you and the sin that so easily entangles you. The problem is, is that we like to hold on to that sin. And we like to be entangled. When we really need to sit there and say, are you willing to give those things up, even good things, in order to experience the, the presence and the power of God in your life, the love and power of God in your life? Are you willing to do that? I mean, let's put this practically speaking. I know so many people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, and the simple truth is, is that going out and having a beer or two isn't a sin. But if you're getting drunk, that is. And for some of you who may be dealing, or for some people who may be dealing with alcoholism, they can't go to a bar and simply have a drink. They need to guard themselves and flee and leave so that they're not being enticed and going out and drinking. It's the same way. When I was hooked on drugs when I was a kid, I had to stop hanging out with my friends who were using drugs. It's not that they were bad people in themselves. It's just that I had to flee and let go. I had to remove those things that were entangling me. And sometimes even good things can be causing you harm. And it's the question is, are we willing to let go and surrender that before God so that we can put those guardrails up and not allow sin to rob us of the presence and the power of God in our lives? Does that make sense? Now I'm ready to drop the bomb on you. It's all good. Recognizing sin is sin. Putting up guardrails and guarding your heart. Fleeing from sin. It's all good. Things that we need to practice. But it's not going to solve it for you. It's not, because we're so rooted on our own self-sufficiency, it's only until we learn by the Spirit of God to defeat the sin, by His power, are we going to be able to find victory. It's not if we do it on our own strength. You could try and try and try, but if you're trying to defeat sin in your life on your own strength, you're going to, never, you're going to fail. And that's what Satan wants. He's going to entice you to sin, then he's going to accuse you of your sin, and then he's going to condemn you for your sin. And you just can't do it on your own. If you could defeat sin on your own by following a couple cute little strategies, not that they're bad, then Jesus would not have needed to come. Listen to what it says in Romans. I love this passage in Romans. It gives me hope. Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh. Metaphorically, sin. 
to live according to it. Listen to verse 13. May it minister to your heart. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, not by your own strength, not by your own cleverness, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of the God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your, your, your son, brought, Spirit you received brought about your adoptions to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, which again is the Aramaic for daddy, father. By him we call it, see, it's what Jesus sit there telling us is through scripture is look it, you can't do it on your own. That's why in Romans 8, 1, right after Apostle Paul says, what a wretched man am I, the very next verse in Romans 8, 1, he's looking, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if we live by the Spirit of God, if we walk by the Spirit of God, it's the Spirit of God who's going to enable us to defeat the sin in our lives because we can do all the steps, but without the power of the Spirit, we will fail. And then when we fail, we end up feeling bad. We want to, and then we say, oh, I can't go to church. I'm not going to pray to God. It's this vicious cycle. And what we really need to be doing, instead of engaging in that vicious cycle, we need to be daily depending upon the Holy Spirit. We need to be daily seeking out, God, I cannot serve you on my strength today. I can't defeat sin today in my own life. I'm dependent upon your power to live the life that you want. Because I'm going to, my own nature, I'm going to go want to do what I do not want to do. And that which I want to do, I'm not going to do that. So I need your strength to do that. I need you to enable me to follow and walk according to your spirit. Because I can't do it on my own. So how do we practically do that? You should be asking yourself that. Always, how does it practically look? Well, the Bible teaches us that. Remember I mentioned to you 1 John 1, 8, where it says, if you say you do not sin, you're a liar, and the truth does not live within you. Well, it's always good to know the whole context. In the very next verse, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if you confess that he is faithful and just to cleanse you and purify you of all unrighteousness. If you confess. You see, one of the key things that we need to do as we're depending upon the Holy Spirit is to be honest with God. Just as Joseph did, and he said, this is sin. So too, when we sin, we need to be honest with God and say, Lord, I've sinned. I'm gonna confess to you what this is. I may not even like it, I may not understand it, but God, I'm just gonna be real with you. I've sinned. Here it is. More, <clears throat> no more just simply ignoring it, <clears throat> pretending like it's no big deal, simply saying, oh, okay, God understands. <clears throat> he understands, but he wants us <clears throat> to confess to him. He wants us, <clears throat> I'm going to still talk even if I can't talk. <clears throat> <clears throat> He wants us to cry out to him. Depend not upon our own strength, <clears throat> but upon him. God wants us to not try to hide our failures, but to be honest with him about our failures. He's a loving dad. He's not simply there to condemn us. He's there to lift us up. But when we sit there and try to deny and hold back and say it's not right or this is that, he's not able to deal with the issue. He's not going to force you. But if you don't allow him into those dark closets of your heart, he's not going to break it down and force his way in your heart. You're not a robot. But if you open the door to your heart, those skeletons in your closet, and you allow God to deal with them, he will deal with them as a loving father. He didn't know about them. It's not like, oh, wow, I didn't know about that. <gasps> Let me just take this back here, okay, you know? No, he didn't know about that. He's just waiting for you to confess it. But it's not just confession. That's the first part. 
but there's also repentance. We depend upon the Holy Spirit by living in repentant lives. You know what repentance means? It sounds real spiritual jargon. And it is spiritual jargon. But literally what it means is to turn around and turn towards God. It means to turn towards God. That's what repentance means. So if you're living in one sin and you're doing this one sin, it means, Lord, forgive me. Here I am. I'm going to surrender this unto you. I'm going to turn towards you. I turn it over towards you. Do you know in Acts, that there's a, a, a passage in Acts where this group of people were living in uh, idolatry and they were practicing sorcery and witchcraft. And you see that when they see the power of God move, they saw God's power move mightily. They confessed their sin and they ended up repenting. And you see their act of repentance by surrendering all these scrolls which were dedicated towards witchcraft and sorcery. And listen to what it says. It says in Acts 19 verse 18, it says, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. So they first they confessed, and then they burned their scrolls publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, which I'm told is a lot of money. And then we read, in this, way the, the word, in, the, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and did what in power? Grew in power. What do we want to experience? The presence and power of God in our lives. It's when they were openly dependent upon the Spirit and they confessed their sin and then they repented of their sin. When we do that, we're depending upon the grace of God. And this is what some of you really need to do today. I'm going to invite the worship team back out. And I want to do something really special with you guys. I want you to respond to God. But here's the truth. Some of you today, you need to hold on to God's hope and grace. You know you're a sinner. Maybe you're really struggling with a sin in your life. But you feel condemned. You think, what a wretched person am I? There's no hope for me. When in truth is, is, if you are willing to confess your sin to God, you have direct access to God because of what Jesus did. If you're willing to confess your sin to God, if you're willing to surrender and repent in the sense of lay down that sin before God's feet, you can boldly go before the throne of God. And you could find mercy and hope in Him. New life. Where you no longer have to carry this guilt around, this burden. Where you can know that you have been forgiven in Christ. Where the power of God can flow mightily through you. Because the Holy Spirit is no longer hindered or hampered or quenched by your sin. Because you are honest with God. We all struggle with sin. And while we're in this body, we're going to have that battle. But we can have victory over that battle as we daily go to God and depend upon His Spirit. As we daily go to God and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Help me with my sin. Here is the sin. I lay it at your feet. Give me your strength to defeat the sin because I can't do it on my own. When we're humble as that, when we're depending upon God in that fashion, when we're honest with God, He moves mightily. When I was younger and I was trying to get off of drugs, I could not do it on my own. I knew I wanted to get off of drugs on my own, but I didn't have the strength to do it. I had that too much of that desire to get high. But once God told me that it was a sin and I need to let it go, I wrestled with him. It was finally when I just said, fine, God, I surrender it unto you. But you know what I said to God? I'll never forget it. I said, I'm not going to be able to do this because I had already tried. I said, okay, God, I get it. You don't want me to get high. You want me to be sober-minded. I get it. But it's not going to happen. Let's be honest, God. Because I've tried to stay sober. There's no way I can. I'm addicted. He just said, surrender it unto me. Watch what I can do. And I did. It wasn't easy. I wish I could say miraculously it was easy. I had to guard my heart. I had to let go of all my drug buddies. 
which was everybody, because that's all I had was drug buddies. I had to let them go. But I depended upon the Spirit, and He moved mightily. That was over 22, 3 years ago. And God has moved like that. He's still moving and doing miracles like that today. It's by God's grace I stand free. It's by God's hope. But it begins with us just surrendering it, being honest and real with God. So this next part of our service, we're going to celebrate with communion. And communion is such a powerful way to restart our day with a message like this. Because the bread is the body of Christ, but it's symbolic of the strength of Christ. Originally, it was, it was given as, as uh, bread, unleavened bread, to give the slaves strength for their journey of freedom. And now we have the body of Christ for strength for our journey. I Meaning we don't do it on our own. And then the blood was blood over the doorpost, which was to, to keep them from the penalty of, the, of, of sin. And now we have the blood of Christ to keep us from the penalty of sin. And so as we partake this morning, if you choose to partake, you're partaking of the bread, saying, I can only depend upon Christ. And I'm partaking in this cup of grape juice, which is symbolic of the blood of Christ. He's saying, I'm only going to try to remain hopeful and remain righteous and holy based on what Jesus has done. I'm not going to sit there and find my value in my successes or my failures, but I'm going to find my value and my identity in what Christ already accomplished on the cross. I'm going to depend upon Him for my hope. So at this time, we're going to we're going to play a few worship songs and worship God. I want you to take this time and I want you to go before God and, and be real with Him. Maybe you have some areas of your life where you just need to confess to God and to say, Lord, I've, I've been doing this on my own and I've been failing. I need to confess it to you. And maybe you need to not only confess, you need to lay it down. Maybe there's a sin in your life that you just did not want to let go of. And God's saying, it's time to let go. Because I can't move in the way I want to move in your life with power until you let it go. Take this time to do this. And when you're ready on your own, come on up and receive the elements and take the elements between you and God. Partake in the bread for strength in Him. Partake in the cup, the blood of Christ for grace and mercy in Him. Whatever you do, don't let this opportunity to go to where you can stand in victory and know that even though you have a battle within, the victory is in the Lord, where you don't have to let it go by another day. I'll have prayer warriors up here as well, and if you just want someone to pray for you, if you want someone to encourage you, and you just want to share, get it off your chest, we want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. We want to strengthen you and walk with you because you're not meant to walk this journey alone. Let's pray.